George McGuinness is the Healthy Ageing Challenge Director at UKRI, which stands for UK Research and Innovation, and is a non-departmental public body of the UK government that directs research and innovation funding, funded through the science budget of the Department for Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy. George has worked in innovation in health and care for many years, actually over 16 years, And he was given the opportunity in January 2019 to lead a major government initiative in the healthy ageing space. George believes that this was an ideal opportunity to make a real difference in something that will affect us all on a large scale, really improving the quality of life in our later years. George particularly values the opportunity to work at the healthier aspects of ageing and bringing together a broad range of interests. That's innovation and social science, for-profit and impact investors, commercial businesses and social ventures. It's also working across a huge range of sectors from healthcare, housing and digital through to consumer goods and utilities. In his free time, George enjoys walking and just before joining UKRI, he completed the Northern Camino, which is a pilgrimage starting in France, travelling all the way to Spain and really enjoys photography and reading in his spare time. Okay, so hi, George. Um, Thank you so much for joining me on today's Mature Movers podcast. Um, So what I would like to kick off with um, is a very kind of open question with how did you become the Healthy Ageing Challenge Director at UKRI? Gosh, that's um, that's a really good question because it's it's a long journey, um, and some of it is completely serendipitous. But um, I, I suppose I'm sort of in my third career as a, as a challenge director. Um, I read engineering um, and uh, then went into the army and spent twenty years doing sort of um, en- engineering things there. And when I left, I decided I wanted to go into some form of management consulting and, and innovation consulting. Um, and then I was just lucky. Um, I um, was asked to do a job uh, that involved some um, work on uh, health IT. Um, after a couple of months, uh, the people there said, oh, well, look, we're trying to set up a new program um, that we call assistive technology. Um, and uh, would you be interested in running it? Uh, and from that, I was sort of seconded into the National Programme for IT for about five years, um, working uh, with really interesting innovators, um, doing a range of things. So everything from um, supporting sub trials, supporting procurements, but also engaging global industry in the development of standards. And that was all really exciting and seemed to be the way forward but nothing was really happening on the ground. It was really slow. And I, from that, I got really interested in healthcare strategy, healthcare reforms uh, and operational improvement. So I then moved back into um, that sort of area. And um, wherever you look, aging is one of the big issues in healthcare. I mean, sometimes it gets divided out into long-term conditions and, and aging, but, but the reality is it's, it's, it's there. And all the way along, I've been working with interesting companies. So some of the times I spent in uh, the Republic of Ireland, uh, running a consulting um, business there, working uh, with startups and the likes of getting into sort of healthcare. And I sort of run my course and I decided actually it was time to step back and um, maybe set up on my own and and go for a more relaxed lifestyle. And I just about got that started and it was beginning to go well. And someone sort of um, tapped me on the shoulder and said, have you ever thought of applying for this job? And I looked at it and it was like everything I've always wanted to do. Um, and um so long story short, you know, I, I applied. Uh, it's not the first time they've been out. They'd, they'd tried to recruit several times, um, went through the interview process um, and found that actually because I've done some work in research, I've 
done innovation have been broader. It wasn't just about older people. Um, I think that they were convinced by um, by me and my my story. Um, one, you know, final reasonably scary interview with the chief exec, Sir Mark Walport at the time, um, and then and then the job was mine. Um, and when I took it over, I think my my biggest concern was that the healthy aging challenge had been up and running for some time. So what was going on? And am I just taking over someone else's work and delivering something that I wouldn't believe in? And actually what I found was the challenge had hit some problems. And my first job was to rethink what we were going to do and how we were going to do it. Um, and that for me was absolutely the pinnacle of what I wanted to be doing uh, with the added bonus that actually I then get to stick around and work and deliver it and see the actual impacts downstream. So so that was my journey in, into that. Um, and I said some of that was serendipitous, but the the bit that I think hangs through all of that is that I, I think you know the greatest career advice you can give to anyone is do something you really believe in. And when you come across aging, uh, you know when I talk about it with my colleagues, colleagues working on net zero projects and some amazing sort of future flight and stuff like that, they all almost look envious at me because this is the one program that we do that everyone relates to. Everyone has a family experience. Everyone is getting older uh, and facing a different world. So it's something I can believe in. Amazing. Um, and just, I mean, that's so inspiring um and the fact that that's something you still love as well and you're doing something that um that you never kind of imagined and I think from a young person's point of view it's really interesting how you've gone from um your initial um career path to then healthy aging and you, you're still doing things that you love and that, that are really that you find you're quite passionate about um, just for those people who are listening who don't really know what the Healthy Aging Challenge is or UKRI, could you kind of sum up what that is for people who have no idea? Well, so it, it starts with a big idea that um, one of the great successes of the last century is that we're all living longer. Um, on average, we're living about 10 years older than our parents, and they've lived 10 years older than their parents, our grandparents. Um, but as we are living longer, we've not really adjusted as well to taking advantage of those extra years. Uh, so we're living longer in poor health. Um, and that's a wasted opportunity. Uh, and so the big question was actually, as you look at this with an aging population, is it inevitable that this is a bad thing, that actually you just get more and more people ill? And, and actually, it's not. There's there's a whole load of life that is um, being lived, but maybe not being valued as much as uh, it would be possible to. So, so the, the big idea was really about helping people, and I'll call it as they age, because it's not just about old people, uh, to remain active, productive, independent, and critically socially connected across the generations for as long as possible, and through that, live a better life. Perfect. And um, and how is UKRI supporting that idea and that concept of promoting better quality of life as we age? So, uh, and, and that's a great question because when you look at what this involved, it's it's not about an industry or, or 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 one topic. It's actually a whole range of things. And so, firstly, we we sort of set about with the help of the Centre for Aging Better to work out what you know what 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 is healthy aging. What do we mean? And it runs from everything to begin with, remaining active having age-friendly homes, age-friendly communities, but also things about living well with cognitive impairments, supporting social connections, and managing what we call the common complaints of aging. And so this isn't a medicalized view of what you're managing. So it's not diabetes and heart failure, but it is mobility. It is continence or you know the things that keep you isolated. It is 
losing sight, losing your hearing and things like that. So what are the things that serve to isolate you? And if you can address them properly, does that enable people to take a, a much uh, you know, fuller um, part in the community around them? And when we stop to find out what this really involves, actually you find that um, it's not just about old people. There's the, you know, a great home, well-designed, actually is well-designed for someone who's, who's getting old and finds it difficult to lift stuff up. Similarly, someone who's just had an operation, someone who's just had a child. Um, all these sorts of bits all come back to really thinking through how do we include as many people in the way that we design the world around us as possible? Yeah, absolutely. And um, it's interesting that you say that you mention about inc inclusivity. Um, now, when it comes to healthy aging, it is, a, it is as you said, it's not an in, it's not a specific industry. It, it's very generalised in the sense that in an ideal world, in an ideal ideal scenario, we age well from the day that we're born, and we do things to basically promote just healthiness throughout life um now even though you like let's say you had this person who did everything by the books they followed all of the advice that they were given to be able to say that this 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 equals a really thriving high quality of life when you're 100 years old although that that, that sounds kind of very straightforward I'm a big believer in that, that that's not, but we're doing the best things that we can to promote that. Now, why don't we as a society or a government promote things like that and focus on a healthy aging outcome rather than a weight loss outcome or rather than a um, aesthetic outcome? What, what are your kind of ideas and opinions on, on that, that aspect? So, I mean, at the heart of your question is this big conundrum facing actually every healthcare system, but you know, ours particularly, um, a system set up to respond to ill health and accidents suddenly finds itself overwhelmed by things that actually are not, um, not predestined um, uh, in terms of long-term conditions and, and, and all the rest of it. So yeah, part of this is about a you know, long-term rebalancing of do we just treat illness or do we actually promote um, through the life course? And, and, and that's, that's a difficult shift to make because, um, you know, probably most famously Michael Marmot would be um, saying, you know, sort of investment in early years pays huge dividends in, in later life. Um, so what does that mean for, for what I'm doing? Is what I'm doing um, irrelevant or, or, or destined to fail? Well, I think um, I, I think two things. One, one is um, you have to start somewhere. And um, by starting where we're starting, there is a, a plausible sort of route to an impact um, in, in the relatively short term, let's say sort of decade sort of time frame. Um, so that that's one. I think the second thing is that we were also trying to open up something new. So we were specifically not about um, what the healthcare system would call integrated or accountable care. We were looking at trying to um, create a market for services and products, particularly for people before they become dependent on, if you like, residential health and social care. So that's that's a, that's a new take. It's moving, yeah, it's, it's moving down towards what you're saying, whole life course. At the same time, I hope the education system and other things are moving upstream uh, or, or up the age age band in, in the other direction. Um, so that's what we were doing. And, you know, while 98 million is a fabulous amount of money to pull into something like this, it's actually still quite small in terms of creating new markets, new opportunities and all the rest of it. Um, and I think uh, maybe a third consideration in the funding is you've also got to bear in mind uh, what's the appetite for coming in. So how do you draw people in and how do you create the wave upon wave of new innovations you have to start somewhere and it's you know I, I think we're halfway through our investment uh, we've got a huge amount of interest but I think that level of funding was about right for what we were trying to do 
Okay, and um, you brief you briefly mentioned earlier um, about taking advantage of those extra years that we have in later life, um, and I guess combining this question with what you what you and your teams are doing um, to promote taking advantage of those later years. Why don't you think we do that? Why do you think we're stuck in a in a, a mindset of oh I'm too old to do this now I I'm I just want to kind of just sit sit and watch tv all day and and just live this sedentary life what why do you think that, that we've got that mindset and we don't want to take advantage of our whole life and we kind of reach a point where we're like right I'm just going to give up now yeah uh, I mean first I'll pull you up as you know it's a sweeping generalization yeah um, no absolutely it is but there are but there are some things that um I think come together to make um make the the effect that it is i mean firstly i think um most of the things that lead to poor health um were probably at some stage fun so there's a huge inbuilt sort of uh, mental sort of um drive towards you know um towards overeating, towards watching too much TV and not exercising, toward, you know, all the rest of it. So, so some of this is a cultural challenge to try and embed the new habits early on, that actually you can feel good, et cetera. Um, some of it actually requires legislative push. So the sugar tax is a good example of something where government intervention actually led to reformulation fairly, fairly quickly. So there are um, those sorts of factors. Um, and then, you know, a couple of big things in society. So we're, we're in a transition from when traditionally there was one typically male breadwinner in a family to one where there are, there are many more. So, you know, a lot of our older population are women who raised families who looked after their parents etc so they've had a different journey to others who've been you know running to catch a train in the morning and um you know all that sort of thing um and then i think another factor it is is retirement um news last week on uh, you know further news of the big retirement lots of over 50s now leaving the workforce not able to do that well, I think a lot of the incentive for that comes from the old style pensions, age based pensions. And, you know, when pensions were first introduced, they were introduced at a time when very few people actually lived to receive a pension. Um, so 30 years ago, I'll, I'll probably get the, the, the actual sort of number wrong, but, you know, people only receive pensions for a few years after retirement before typically that. And now we're living so much longer. So, um, so pensions were not never set up, but they, they create an inbuilt incentive to say, actually, I, I'm going to sort of, um, uh, fold it in and enjoy the rest, rest of my life. And then find that actually that enjoyment doesn't necessarily come with the same sense of purpose, the same opportunities to mingle and meet people, um, might actually mean that you spend what you've got in pension and savings faster than you were anticipating, leading to pen, you know, poverty and things like that. So there are you know, a whole load of um, factors that, that lead to where we are today. And some of the innovations are really about trying to say, well, actually, how do we break out of that cycle? And is there anything that you're doing at the moment that you think is really impactful with any of the projects or kind of any of the main focuses within the Healthy Ageing Challenge? Well, I'd, I'd have to say that I think, you know, anything that we fund uh, is really interesting and, and impactful and, and impactful in different sorts of ways. So when, um, when I took over, I think the brief was, you know, this is all about, services to scale uh, and I had the view that actually this was still an innovative market so just focusing on scale up was probably the wrong way of, of approaching it so we have our trailblazer projects large projects you know very close to market trying to take services scale and some really interesting stuff around them I, I think 
one of the interesting asides about the trailblazers is that we've got five projects. They're led from five different industries. Um, yeah. So we've got financial services, we've got leisure, we've got um, homes and care, we've got digital, and we've got an energy utility in there, all working on different aspects. Actually, three of them have a very strong built environment component to them, the homes we live in, the communities that we um, we, we, we inhabit, um, which actually, as a second aside, as, as an engineer, I thought when I started, built environment, expensive, takes a lot of time. We're not going to see much innovation there, but we're seeing masses of innovation in, in that space, and that's good. So that's our scale-ups. But other things that I'm really sort of pleased to see, yes, there's early stage stuff, but we've also opened up a whole new area of, of investment in innovation in social impact. So we're just about to launch a, a second wave competition for funding social ventures. So particularly funding existing social ventures who find it very difficult to raise money because typically they can't take equity or, or things like that. Um, and we're funding them to scale up to get to the next stage where they could become investable, but, but actually really to broaden their impact. And linked to that, we brought in impact investors people like Prostate Cancer Research as a charity, people like Nesta, people like the Social Tech Trust, to bring their money in and help magnify what, what the government funding money can, can do as well. So, you know, thinking about scale, thinking about who are we impacting and how do we really reach the populations where this will make a difference, uh, I think has, has um, really sort of, th those are things I'm really proud of, actually. Brilliant. And it's, I mean, it all sounds really exciting. And um, this new launch of and focusing on social um, enterprises and, and organisations that are, that have that real passion behind things. I mean, I, I think they all they all start from passion. Uh, but I think social organisations have just got a real um, love for, for what they do. And um I think that's really interesting that and, and important that that's now being a focus because there's so many great things that are going on that, as you said, really, really struggle for funding and really, really struggle for that scale scalability. Um, in terms of healthy ageing and um, focusing on services or products that may improve quality of life why do you think it might i'm in the opinion of that this is quite a recent thing um in the last let's say i don't know 80 to 100 years where we've really focused on this why do you think it's been so neglected in the past do you think maybe it's the lack of research or the the lack of awareness what, what's your kind of thoughts on that um gosh yeah lots of factors um Firstly, and most obviously, the, the social change involved. You know, um, we have an aging population. Um, you know, some commentators say that, um, you know, being part of a large cohort, birth cohort, is actually good news because you've got the, if you like, the voter power and the persuasion to actually change the world. And so we've now got the so called baby boomers generations um, into retirement. Um, they, they, live longer than previous. So there is a new, if you like, um, pressure to, to think about that. Um, also, the way that we live and work. So I I didn't live anywhere near my parents while, uh, after I graduated um, from university. So I wasn't on hand to um, rush around the corner and do stuff. Neither were they on hand to rush around the corner and look after our kids when when, when that was there. So we're living differently. Um, and all of these things mean that actually we've got to think about how do we respond to that. And that then links back to what I was saying. It's When I talk about it, I, I, I use the word services before I use products because I don't think it's so much product, but it's actually how you pull things together that will really make a difference. You know, really good example. So um, I said my parents lived, lived away. So when my mother got to the stage where she was falling regularly and, and hurting herself, I was thinking, well, I know an awful lot about telecare systems and all the rest of it. But the reality was 
none of the technology that I could fit in the house would uh, would actually solve the problem. Would get someone round to pick her up or do something. It would just it, it needed that whole service wrap around it. Uh, and I think that's that's a sort of problem that a lot of people face, and that's why we're we're sort of really interested in in how those things um, come about. But it's not just about those sorts of services. So one of our uh, trailblazer projects uh, is with London Rebuilding, and they're looking at completely new um, sort of mortgage products and uh, related insurance products, so that people who have a home are effectively asset rich and cash poor are able to do things. So able to modify their home so they could create an income by taking in a lodger in a thing or divide it up to have a living carer. Um, uh, be able to release some of the equity to take out a caring bond sort of sort of practice. So lots of those sorts of things, not just the sort of service delivery, but the financial services and, and others behind it. Mm. I guess you've got a great kind of wholesome approach to ageing as well, uh, because you have a great understanding of all of these elements that people don't really think about, where it, whether it's financial, whether it's care, whether it's mobility, um, to um, kind of connectivity and loneliness and things like that. And do you think that that's Im- influenced or impacted your own life and your own living style? Uh, that's, a, that's, a, that, that's a great question. Um, I, it, 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 the short answer would be yes. But, um, the long answer is I'm, I'm, I'll be struggling to actually give you the, the precise examples. Um but I, you know, I know I, um, I took up and still do sort of much more sort of long distance walking. Um, I'm much more conscious about um, people around, uh, and I notice things in, in differently. So, so, you know, when I talk about innovation and intergenerational uh, innovation, one of the, one of the examples I use is is how increasingly you see um, people who are old not using a walking crane or a walking stick, but using walking poles, because it's become much more, usually it's less a badge of, of, of older age. So I I see that. Um, I, I think I, I work it, uh, with, with a huge amount of optimism that, that life can be good. I'm constantly reminded that it's not good for everyone. And so so there are still needs that peop- people have. So. Um, one of the really interesting projects that we've funded recently is is with a company called WeWalk, who work with uh, blind organisations around the world, and they've got a um, a smart adapter that goes on the end of a blind cane, and they're which which helps people navigate, and they're developing that now to give us sort of what they call an indoor navigation um, capability, so uh, for them to be able to detect obstacles that are not at floor height and would be detected by their cone, but that stops them walking into things and helps them get around. Those sorts of innovations are hugely empowering to people who uh, would otherwise, you know, 50 years ago, they'd have probably been put into an institution and kept there. Um, increasingly, they're living more independent lives. Um, and, you know, these innovations just allow many more people to live what we would think of as is a normal life. Mm-hmm. And how accessible and affordable, and you don't need to, not specifically for this um, WeWalk um, service, mm-hmm. but how accessible and affordable do you think new technologies around assisted living are? Um, well, that's that, that's a really interesting question because one of, um, one of the things I talked about supporting social impact and, and impact investors Um when I've talked to investors, particularly early on, people say, well, innovation gets into the market by coming in as expensive and, you know, it'll be taken up by people who can afford it. Um, you know, when the volumes go up and the price goes down, eventually it will become, you know, sort of universal. And people use smartphones as as that paradigm. And I'm convinced, actually, that that actually there is also a bottom-up innovation component here. Um, And it doesn't need to be expensive, but there is innovation and it does need supporting. Um, And that was partly the motivation behind uh, the social ventures piece that I talked about. But 
we estimate another sort of um, statistic, if you like, in our investment, and that's um, that's actually the social gradient. Um, so, so are are the things that we're funding targeted at those most able to pay, targeted at a broad audience, or specifically targeted at those least able to pay? Um, and I'll tell you how successful we've been in a minute, but one of the ways that we've actually helped make good investment decisions, so we're not specifically saying we only want something from there, but we've in included older people um, in our governance and decision-making. So all our projects get reviewed uh, by a sort of panel of um, older people, and those those views come forward. When we have interview panels, I actually have um, an older person's representative um, as a voting member of the interview panel, and it changes the discussion. Now, what's the impact? Well, I'd say about a quarter of our investments to date are targeted at the lowest income groups. And inclusive of that, three quarters are broadly targeted, inclusive of lower income groups. So relatively little is actually high-end innovation um, or enabling in innovation. So, we, we, for instance, we've got one, um, one sort of project looking at, at um, polypharmacy. So that's that's the and specifically the genetics of people who take lots of different medicines and the interaction of those different medicines with with their genes and does that make it more effective? Clearly, that's a long term play. Mm. Um, so that's in that sort of enabling high ends of innovation bracket, but we're doing much more in, in the way of, of on the ground things that will make a difference now. Wow, brilliant. Well, it's all very exciting, um, all this innovation and, and all these projects that you're putting on. Um, and I just, I guess I want to look, we'll close things soon. Um, but from your point of view, for anybody who's interested in starting up an innovation that they think may assist themselves or their, their loved ones, how would they go about um, initially working with UKRI or the Healthy Aging Challenge um, to get that off the ground or not necessarily if they're wanting to scale up and they're at that position to do that? So, um, and again, that's a great question. And, and I'm going to sort of start by saying, actually, there's a much broader ecosystem than UKRI out there. And they're, they're all important um, players in helping innovators come up with great ideas. So one of our, one of our funding streams is uh, specifically uh, reaching out to researchers with ideas that they want to develop um, and help take them on an entrepreneurial journey. And that journey could end up in uh, spinning out a company, a for-profit company. It could end in spinning out um, a social venture. It could be a social movement or, or, or even inform policy. But the idea that they've actually been working in research and want to think about a route to impact. And so we're working with an accelerator, Zinc. That's, that, that's one thing. Um, and we've got another call coming up um, shortly. Um, I, I should say we're still still working on 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 the likes of that. But there are also uh, since I started three three and a half years ago, um, the National Innovation Centre for Aging has opened its doors properly up in Newcastle and moved into its building uh, and has a Pathfinder program to help innovators. Um, it's also part of a a virtual institute called the Design Age Institute, um, which is sort of led from the Royal College of Art in, in London, but includes Newcastle, includes Oxford University, includes the International Longevity Centre. These people have a huge amount of information on uh, ageing, you know, design and, 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 and you know, issues like that. And what I would sort of say is, is First and foremost, go out and talk and test your idea. Um, because there are some really, really great ideas that if only they've got a little bit more input from 
people who understand this, people who understand design processes and things like that, they could be so much more successful. And that's what we really want. We want everyone with a great idea to come forward and be successful. Once they've got that idea, that's the point at which really you can start looking at the funding streams. And so there are organisations like Innovate UK, KTN, that used to be called the Knowledge Transfer Network, who you know, register with them, free newsletter, they publicise all the opportunities to apply for grant funding. Um, I would have to say, you know, one, we, we only fund quality projects, and two, it's highly competitive. So it's really worth doing that upfront stuff um, to, to be successful. But grant funding is, is the first rung, rung of the ladder. We also have investment partnerships with investors. So eventually you're going to not be dependent on government grants, but actually think about how you make your enterprise, whether it's a social enterprise or a for-profit one, successful um, and, and go on from there. So um, uh, in short, there's lots of help out there. Um, sign up to our community practice, sign up to the KTN's newsletter um, and find out what's, what's going on and how to tap into it. Brilliant. Well, thank you so much, George. Um, and if we want to kind of follow all the work that you're doing, um, what, where is the best place to kind of keep an eye on that? Well, um, the, the best place is actually UKRI's website, um, which is UKRI.org. Um, and if you search on healthy aging, um, that's probably the easiest way to get our page because it can be a little bit hidden. It's there. Actually, if you Google UKRI healthy aging, it'll come up as well. We have recently published um, our story so far. Um, that's a sort of printout version, but there's, there's an online version. There's a supporting video that will give you an idea of some of the projects we funded from research through to those innovation projects. Um, and um, yeah, we're always interested in um, people wanting to find out more. Brilliant. Thank you so much. Um, and thank you so much for talking to me today. Um, I really appreciate the time and I'm really excited to see the next kind of phase and also find out more about the um, social projects that you have coming up soon. Great. Lovely. Well, thank you very much for um, having me on your um, podcast.